Hello and welcome back to Lower Intermediate Conversation, Professor Kent Lee. Uh, another uh, kind of plain lecture. Sorry about that, but uh, didn't have much choice. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to talk more about linguistic politeness and some things that go along with that. So many of you are language majors, English majors and such. And as language majors, it's important for you to know a little linguistics uh, including the linguistics of politeness. And you might take a class in pragmatics where you learn a lot more about this stuff, but if you're not, um, this is helpful to understand the linguistics of English and intercultural communication and some, some cross-cultural differences. We're gonna talk a little bit more today about cultural differences in communication and also we're going to talk about what we, what we call discourse markers in signposting. So discourse markers are those kinds of transition words, things like since, though, because, as well as transition words that structure conversation, like, you know, like, like the way, way we use like in colloquial English, well, uh, uh, oh, um, you know, I think, I mean, a little bit, of, we'll talk about some of those. And some of these discourse markers also function for what's called signposting, ways of structuring conversation with certain uh, either transition words or discourse markers or other expressions to indicate pe to people where you're going, like first, second, third, or now, now let's move on to this, or uh, getting back to such and such, uh, signposting expressions. We'll talk about some of them here. Uh, in and especially in terms of linguistic politeness. So let's start with uh, discourse markers. Think about these words in Korean. What are their functions in Korean? Okay, kind of like the like in English, it's kind of a softener or a hedge. For example, it's like, I don't know, you or he was like really weird. Well, you're kind of softening it or hedging it to not commit yourself too much to the literal meaning of what you're saying or to soften it for the sake of the person listening. Uh, so hokshi is common, I think, especially among female speakers and it's used as that sort of hedge or softener. And we'll talk a little bit later about like in English. Tukki, um, tukbilhi, especially, uh, it's, an, it's for emphasis. Now, there is one difference, though, in English. Uh, if you put this at the beginning of a sentence in English, it then does two things. It's emphasis, but it's also a sentence adverb. So a sentence adverb is something you start a sentence with that indicates your attitude toward the whole sentence. So when you start a sentence with hopefully, thankfully, regrettably, regrettably we weren't able to finish the report on time, or thankfully we finished it on time, or of course we're going to finish it on time. So especially at the beginning, it's a sentence adverb and it's also going to emphasize the whole sentence. And this might be okay in casual conversation, but not so much in formal, very formal conversation or formal writing. In formal writing or speaking, it would be better to put it inside the sentence um, to modify one particular word in the sentence. So here, it would be more formal to say, we especially need a new computer system in, the, in this office. In case of kyongyue, kyongyue nun, this doesn't translate exactly to English. Sometimes, yeah, but it sounds very colloquial. In my case, I don't know. That's very colloquial style. In more formal style, just, I don't know, you just leave it out. Now, in other cases, it's like a conditional. In case of fire, it's kind of an impersonal, uh, like for impersonal things like signs, notices, uh, instructions, in case of fire, meaning if there's a fire, call 911, and that's the emergency number in North America. So politeness linguistically consists of two types, positive politeness, which means affirming someone else's status, and there are gonna be some cultural differences here, and also cultural differences in negative politeness, and that's where you're 
trying to soften or mitigate um, something that's a threat to their team young. Uh, and that includes even if you're just imposing upon them. Uh, you interrupt the person, you have to interrupt the person or ask them to do something that's kind of an imposition upon them. And there are different um, things we do in order to kind of soften uh, the imposition. So just think for a minute, um, in English and in your language or languages, what are some linguistic strategies for managing, for expressing positive and negative politeness? What do you think? Okay, positive politeness, um, especially in East Asian culture, you use honorifics, uh, honorific expressions, less so in Western culture. Uh, some things are hard to translate, at least calling you know, somebody by titles that's sort of honorific. Um, English doesn't really have a distinction, such a distinction in the grammar in formality levels like other languages do. Uh, politeness function words, and there'll be a, a few differences in politeness function words. Um, in Korean, you say to somebody who's providing you a meal, uh, if they're treating you to a meal, you would say like "chal makisimnida" or "chal magisimnida." But uh, we don't have an expression like that exactly in English. You would just say, "Oh, thank you for treating me." Um, but one time, I was treating some student workers. And she was trying to, one was trying to express it in English. It doesn't translate into the English. And she said, thank you for uh, feeding me or something like that. And this doesn't work in English. We'll, we'll see another example. Here, here's another example in, in English where we're missing. Many languages have an expression for the, the host or the person treating you. It says, like in French, bon appetit. Um, we don't really have an expression in English like this. It's like, uh, enjoy your meal. Uh, or in German, guten appetit. Uh, Spanish or Italian, bon appetito and things like that. American or English lacks a direct expression. We might just say, enjoy your meal. Uh, or kind of very colloquial. This is colloquial, might say, dig in. Dig in, like digging into your food. That's very kind of slangy. You know, don't do it in a business context. Uh, just enjoy your meal, enjoy. But we don't have a, we can sometimes, in formal settings, we can, in English, we can use the French expression, bon appetit. Or it's actually in French, bon appetit, but Americans say bon appetit because they don't know how to pronounce French right. Compliments, of course, giving compliments, and again, this may be more common in East Asian culture, including maybe um, compliments that are just for you don't really mean them, it's just to make the person feel good, maybe exaggerated compliments or pretending to be interested in you know, their work or what they're doing. Be careful though, because in Western culture, this will not go over as well. Uh, if it seems insincere, uh, if the Westerner thinks that it's not sincere, it will not be successful. So be careful about using exaggerated compliments or uh, pretending to be interested. Uh, or another term is pro forma. Pro forma, uh, you don't really mean it, you're just saying a compliment just to be polite. Pro forma, that means just uh, doing, you're going through the motions just for the sake of the form, uh, the language form of giving a compliment just to make the person feel good, not because you really appreciate or think it's good. But be careful pro forma compliments with Westerners, if seen as insincere, might not work. Inclusion, including somebody, somebody who's listening to conversation and maybe they want to be involved, but they don't have anything to say and just turning to the person and say, what do you think? You know, uh, it's a good technique, by the way, because you're more likely to be seen as friendly and sincere and you know, sincere and, and uh, considerate. In-group identity markers. We'll talk a little bit later about like, but have you like noticed how like some young uh, American and British people like, they put like in like every sentence like, 
Well, one reason they do that or one reason they use slang or unique slang forms, it's kind of an in-grip identity marker. It's like we're part of the cool group because we use like all the time or uh, some other slang term that's unique to a particular subculture. Uh, so African-American slang, kind of Silicon Valley, California slang, or what was called Valley Girl slang, it was once popular, things like that. People use those because it's kind of a, a group identity thing. And so if a parent tries to learn the slang of his, his or her teenage children, they're gonna say, Dad, don't do that, it's awkward, okay? He's trying to be cool, he's trying to maybe uh, fit in or be nice to his teenage children, but his children are going to go, Dad, don't do it. it you're too old, you're not one of us, okay? It's our thing, it's our teenage slang. Don't, don't do it, you're not one of us, don't. Uh, finally, token agreement, you agree with somebody kind of pro forma. Token is like, you know, like these, uh, some places you buy bus tokens, it ha it's a coin, it really has no value itself, but you just put in the uh, thing to get on the little box to get on the bus in some countries, uh, bus token or train token. Um, so just agreeing, pretending to agree with somebody, even though you don't really agree. So can you see where that might cause cultural misunderstandings, some of these things? We'll, we'll see later. Um, let's talk about positive politeness. Okay, let's look at some other types of positive politeness. Um, small talk. Now, some people, especially more introverted people, may not like small talk as much. Um, some of us prefer kind of more intelligent conversation instead, but what do you do small talk about? To do build solidarity with like a new coworker, a new friend, uh, classmate. Maybe it's talking about the weather. Maybe it's gossiping about somebody, uh, talking about something in the news. Uh, and one type of small talk, and I don't know if this really is common in East Asian culture, but ritual complaints. Uh, it's a kind of small talk where you complain about something, some thing you both kind of don't like. You're sitting in class, it's, you have a few minutes before the professor comes in and, and you turn to your classmate and you start complaining about the professor. Oh, this professor is so hard. This professor is weird. This professor is crazy. Or you complain about the weather. Go, oh, it's so bloody cold. You know? um, so complaining about something. And this may be more common in Western culture and it's not necessarily a negative attitude. It can be, um, but sometimes it's just a sort of small talk. Tag questions, we'll, we'll just talk about tags in a minute. Uh, and other kinds of questions, just to be nice, just to be polite. Uh, promises and offers, again, in East Asian cultures, may be more common to make a pro forma offer, like, uh, why don't you come to my house sometime for dinner? And you don't mean it, you're just being polite. Be careful with Westerners. Westerners are less likely to understand that it's a pro forma offer and they may think you really want to have dinner or some time. So be careful with that with Westerners, uh, especially Northern Europeans and North Americans, because um, we don't really do that as much in our culture and it can be misunderstood. Okay, tag questions. And of course, again, you have to make the tag, the opposite kind of polarity from the main verb can be confusing. So I tell students, just use the Canadian A, it's easy. You're going tomorrow, eh? You're not going tomorrow, eh? That was a great game, eh? Oh, that was hard, eh? It's easy. So you can have two different tags, two different intonations though. Um, some tags are information, you're actually asking information. Uh, some are just confirmatory with a different intonation. So you're going tomorrow, aren't you? You're going tomorrow, aren't you? So the first one, aren't you? I think that's I think that's more confirmatory. You just you think so, but you're just asking for confirmation. You're going tomorrow, aren't you? The rising intonation. I think that's more like seeking information. Like I'm not sure. I, I'm asking for information. So you're going tomorrow, aren't you? Confirm conf, confirmation. You're going tomorrow, aren't you? More informational. Uh, you're Canadian, eh? Or it's more confirmation. Or 
informational. You're Canadian, eh? Negative politeness. Uh, so uh, they're politeness function words. So we talked about some, like there's some cultural differences, like the American, like enjoy your meal uh, and things like that for positive and negative politeness. Uh, sometimes for negative politeness, like sorry, excuse me. Uh, and there are slight cultural differences. Canadians tend to have a reputation more often for saying excuse me or sorry. Just for negative politeness, not they're real, they're not really apologizing, but just um, like um, I'm sorry, like I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you're upset, not because I'm apologizing. I'm just I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, and we mentioned euphemisms. Um, he passed away, and so that he died. Apologies. Um, there might be slight differences in people's expectations. They're both cross cultural differences sometimes, but also personal differences. What do you do for giving an apology? Well, there's several different things you can do. Uh, one can be just, well, aside from just saying, I'm sorry, the literal apology itself, there are different components. Uh, one might be a promise not to do it again. Uh, and to some people that might be more meaningful, but other people might prefer to hear an explanation. Okay, why did you do that? How could you have done something so rude? An explanation. Uh, not an excuse, but just an explanation. No, maybe an excuse. Maybe you do need to excuse yourself. Sorry, you couldn't make it, but, you know, there was a car accident along the way and the traffic was blocked. So an excuse or an explanation. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I didn't know that about your past. I didn't mean to, to offend you. So an explanation uh, and a promise not to do that thing again. Uh, and then maybe more importantly for some people, and maybe more importantly in Western culture, more than the apology itself is actually changing your behavior. Uh, so if your apology is just pro forma, uh, maybe you're apologizing because you have to, and you don't really change, then especially Westerner or people with you know, certain personality preferences uh, might think your apology was not sincere and that just makes it worse. Um, so if you're giving pro forma apologies, you're, you're, you apologize because your boss told you to, you know, you, you, this might be a tricky situation if you can't really change your behavior. Uh, maybe some people might be less concerned with the apology and more concerned if you actually change your behavior, like, you know, stop being rude to me. Don't just apologize, but just stop being rude to me in the future. And, and if you don't, then they think the apology was not sincere. Sometimes it's common to give vague or ambiguous answers. We talked about an example in a minute, but again, um, Westerners, Western cultures might more prefer directness rather than vague, ambiguous answers. But of course, I can see why uh, there's more of an emphasis in East Asian culture here, anyway, for negative politeness. So vague or ambiguous answers instead of saying no directly an, an ambiguous answer um, might be a safer way socially in East Asian culture but it uh, may or may not work as well in when talking to Westerners or people people from other cultures. Uh, let's look at an example of ambiguous answers or vague answers. Uh, can you imagine some American business people trying to do business with some Japanese business people and the, you know, the, the Americans are trying to sell them on their business idea uh, or negotiation. They're trying to negotiate something and the Japanese just say, yes. How do you think that that could be misunderstood? Well, there have been, Actual cases where maybe Americans who they didn't do their homework, they didn't really prepare and learn about the culture, kind of their fault, partly, uh, maybe more so their fault, I think. Um, so they're giving their, you know, their ideas or their proposal and the Japanese nod and say yes. They're just being polite. They don't really mean yes. If then the Americans or if the Americans try to press for an answer, yes or no. And the Japanese will give maybe an indirect answer or a vague answer. And, or we need to think about it. 
And the Americans, if they don't know the culture well enough, if they haven't done their homework in preparation, they might think, oh, okay, they actually want to talk about it first. When actually the Japanese are politely saying no. Uh, and Americans might not get it, and there can be misunderstandings, cultural misunderstandings as results of these differences in negative politeness. Okay, let's get on to some discourse markers. Um, so why do we say well? Well, one kind of thing is uh, what we call a, okay, so one function of well might be, uh, you, need to you need a second to think well, so you need a second to think before you can actually formulate your response. Uh, and that's one function. Uh, so pauses, delays, uh, sometimes topic shifts or turn taking. Well, uh, I need, you need to pause, you need to think for a minute. Or well, let's move on to our business. You're gonna, uh, people want to, they're kind of talking about one thing and you get their attention and say, well, let's move on to something else. Or well, like I was saying, uh, so sometimes for, uh, Turn taking. Uh, people are talking about some other stuff and you need to get back to the business. And you, so you speak up and say, Well, like I was saying, and so you're taking, you're jumping into the conversation again and you're trying to bring the conversation back to, you know, your previous topic. Uh, linguistically, we call these just preferred responses. Uh, so it, it's kind of softening negative politeness. Um, People are talking about something and you say, well, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, their preferred, re preferred response, what they prefer to hear is, yeah, sure, I can do it, but you have to say no. So you're going to soften it so it can be both a pause marker, but also uh, softening a dispreferred response. They don't prefer to hear no, but you have to say no. I don't know if I can make it. Or, they're busy talking, they're having fun talking about one thing and you need to uh, kind of interrupt them. It's kind of an imposition and interruption and you have to soften the negative politeness and go, well, let's move on. So uh, you say, well, hurry up. Okay. It's kind of softening a command, right? They're happy taking their time. You say, well, hurry up. Uh, well, I don't think so. Again, that's not what they prefer to hear. You're disagreeing. How about O? Oh, you probably know O. Oh. Um, you probably real realize it's a realization marker. O oh is kind of a realization marker and surprise. Okay, you probably know that. It has some other little functions. You can take a pragmatics class too. I mean, uh, it's kind of a self-correction. So it's a, I don't know the scientist, I mean the engineer. Uh, and sometimes, because this is self-correction, it might soften something a little bit. She was angry. I mean, she was really indignant to clarify. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of softening but things by saying, uh, you probably know this, but I'm pointing it out anyway. So it's sort of negative politeness. I'm not saying that you don't know this. I just feel I need to comment on it. That moron is our president, you know. You know, that really bugs me. Yeah, it's kind of, in that sense, it's sort of like naturally or of course. Can't wait forever, you know. It's kind of obvious. Like, you probably know that, but I just want to point it out to you. Okay has a lot of meanings. Okay. 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 So practice with different intonations. What are the different meanings? They have a lot of different in, in, in meanings. It means like, uh, I agree with you, it means, okay, I'll do it. Uh, or, okay, like somebody said something really weird. Okay, using the okay, the intonation kind of makes it a little more sarcastic, like not okay, like you're accepting it, but you're being, sar you're being sarcastically accepting in order to point out that was, that sounds really strange. Now is a transitional, uh, especially in spoken context, when you need to make a transition. Now, as I was, as I was saying before, or blah, blah, blah. Now let's move on to our next thing. So it starts the sentence, it's got an extra high, it's got a high intonation. Now, as I was saying before. And um, you might notice Americans ending sentences with though. It's kind of like, however, a contrast. I don't really know though. 
And one time I was using this in a class and one of my students from Latin America was really puzzled by it. She didn't know this discourse function of though. It's kind of like, however, although, like, uh, it's kind of, but I'm not really sure. I don't really know though. But we sometimes end sentences with this discourse marker, kind of like, but. Of course, we have uh, fillers. These are kind of back channels or feedbacks, like I'm listening to you, somebody's talking, go, mm, yeah, uh huh. Mm. And also for uh, filler or pause markers, you need a, just a half second to think of what you're going to say, especially in the middle of the sentence, and we can go, um, mm. but be careful not to use it too much. I know I have a tendency to use it too much because I'm maybe thinking, overthinking what I'm gonna say in a lecture. So as I listen to myself in video, I've tried to cut back on these field pauses because too many field pauses makes you sound like either you're not prepared or you're not sure, or maybe you're just overthinking things as I tend to do. Sometimes instead of a field pause, sometimes it's better just to have a silent unfilled pause and move on and get to your point. Notice I did a unfilled pause, a silence, and that might be better for getting people's attention. So instead of seeing blah, 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 uh, blah, 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 we go. Now in this report, we found that pause and that gets people's attention. So sometimes an unfilled or silent pause sometimes might be better. But especially if you're giving presentations, too many ums, uh, too many filled pauses, pause markers will kind of detract from your performance or how fluent or fluid you seem or people will think you're not really prepared or you're not confident. Like, so let's talk about the like. So it's a softener, a hedge marker, and it's used a lot, especially among younger people in North America and England, but even older people like me say it sometimes. It's common pretty common now. So it's a discourse marker, it's kind of a softener, sometimes also for maybe both softening but also um, the main point of the sentence, so it's more common, I find, I think I, I, it's more common in the middle or near the end of a sentence because it's more often softening kind of like the main point of the sentence which is in your predicate. So maybe you could soften the whole sentence like, like could you like loan me like $200? So I'm putting in two softeners. This is very slangy, colloquial. So I'm softening the whole sentence, the request, and then the what's really gonna be uh, surprising is I'm asking you for $200, so I'm softening that. So two softeners, and again, older people don't like this. Sounds too slangy, uh, maybe annoying to older people. My roommate never cleans when I ask him to, like I asked him yesterday. So I'm kind of softening the fact that I requested any different. It's like, he just like sits around all day. So maybe I don't mean literally all day watching football and really doing absolutely nothing all day. I'm kind of qualifying it or softening it or hedging it. But it's kind of like that. It's as if he's just sitting around all day and doing nothing and watching TV. Now there's a section, second function of like, and that's a quotative. So quotative is like a quotation marker. He said, she said, uh, she exclaimed, uh, or I thought, and sometimes you can report what you're thinking with a quotative. And like is kind of a very flexible quotative also, where it's to report, it's maybe not literally what, maybe somebody's exact words, but maybe what somebody thought or what you thought. So it can be a quotative to kind of report what you thought or to kind of rephrase or paraphrase what somebody said or what you thought. And so it's whether it's to quote what somebody actually said or what you, were, what you said or what you're thinking kind of depends on the context. You kind of have to guess maybe. So I asked him if he wanted to apply and he was like, I don't know. So he said something like, I don't know. Maybe not those exact words, but you're kind of paraphrasing. I don't think it pay, pays very well. So I'm like, dude, so dude is kind of a very slang term for like guy, person, male. So I'm like, dude, you have to get a job somewhere, you know? 
So you often reduces to ya in English. We'll talk about colloquial contractions later and reductions. So like is very colloquial as a softener and also as a quotative. Don't overuse it unless you want to annoy older people. Um, it's okay to use it sometimes in occasionally in formal conversation, especially in formal context, business context. Make sure you're not overusing it. Um, it's fine if you want to blend in. You go out with your coworkers after work to a pub. Um, so you're working in England and you go to the pub with your coworkers, your mates. Mates is kind of a slang term in British English for like your friends. Uh, and maybe there you can use it more, um, but don't overuse it. Don't sound too informal where you need to sound formal. Some other markers for kind of maybe making transitions to new topics or you need to get back to what you were talking about before. So kind of a colloquial or informal one is anyway. Anyway, back to the topic of our meeting. That's kind of in, that's informal. Uh, now is kind of good for formal or informal, especially more formal or semi-formal settings like in a meeting. Now, as I was saying, or a lecture. Uh, now the next two, as for, as regards, that sounds more formal. And don't overdo it because um, it sound, if you overuse these, it will sound kind of unnatural. It may be more common in business writing than in spoken English. Uh, it sounds kind of formal. If you're using it in spoken English, uh, don't do it in casual conversation. It's more like for a meeting or presentation or lecture. As for the end result matter, it sounds formal or it sounds artificial. So don't overuse it in speaking. Okay, so finally, if you're maintaining the floor, that is who has the right to speak, maybe you need to maintain the floor. You don't want someone to interrupt you. What do you do? You end a sentence with a rising intonation sometimes. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this and then you talk about it, but don't use it, use it too much because it will sound like you don't have confidence or sounds weak. Sometimes he'll pause us. We need to start get in on the conversation and sometimes East Asian students who are maybe taking classes in the US and are supposed to engage in class discussions, small group discussions in class. How do you, people are talking back and forth and you wanna get in and say something. How do you do it? Of course, just starting, um, maybe just starting with a pause, pause marker, um, uh, might be a w way of signaling to people, I want to talk, I want to say something now. Or even just audibly inhaling, audibly breathing in, indicates you're about to speak. Sometimes that works. Uh, longer field pauses, um, you, you, you're in the middle of a sentence and you need more time to think, then just go, um, um, uh, people think, are you okay? Something wrong? Maybe you use something like, um, I think, I mean, it's like, you know, but don't use too many, but sometimes you can use another expression instead of just going, uh, 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 like something wrong with you. Use another kind of comment phrase, a comment clause, like, I think, it's like, you know, or I mean, um, I think, even starting a sentence, you need time to think. Someone asks you a question, uh, I think, well, let me think about that or something like that. And try not to just overuse, um, uh, or silence. Maybe East Asians might more likely use silence in conversation because they're thinking, but maybe Westerns would think, oh, you don't have anything to say and they'll just move on without you and continue the conversation. Uh, and, uh, you may need to speak up more at least go uh well i think you know in order to get the floor the right to speak the right to say something okay if you have any questions about these feel free to ask me um, these are some things to think about these are helpful ways this politeness theory is a convenient way of talking about some cultural differences in in communication and language and I think next time we'll talk more about some colloquial um, aspects of English, including contractions. You might or might not have learned, but they're important for understanding English media. So we'll get, in, get into that next time. So enjoy. Good luck on your assignments.